Welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sung, and today is Tuesday. I'm running a little late, and last week we missed a video because I'm in practice, and uh, sometimes we run late with patients. So today we're going to talk about central vestibular disorders, primarily the cerebellum. Okay. So last week, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about peripheral disorders, uh, uh, the otoconia in their ear, uh, canal issues, um, and, and uh, fistulas, and so forth. Today we're going to talk about cerebellum. The cerebellum is what integrates all the input from the, the vestibular apparatus, as well as from, let's say, the lower extremity and so forth. And it integrates the frontal lobe uh, or parts of the cortex. So if we just look at the cerebellum, there is the midline, the intermediate, and lateral cerebellum. There's also an anterior and posterior cell cerebellum, and there's something called a flocular nodular lobe. Um, without you know going into too much detail and, and giving you a bunch of words that you know you probably won't understand, let's go into some of the symptoms that you might experience when you have cerebellar disorders or cerebellar dysfunction or cerebellar disease. Right? There's different distinctions, but sometimes you can't pick up cerebellar disease early on. Uh, and later on, when it gets more advanced, you might pick it up on imaging, such as an MRI. Uh, when you look at imaging of the cerebellum, sometimes you will see what we call volume loss. You will see that the volume of the cerebellum uh, is different from a normal, healthy cerebellum. So that's one sign of cerebellar uh, disease. Another one is cerebellar antibodies. So you can actually find different antibodies uh, that shows that it has an immune reaction to the cerebellum. So things like gluten can affect cerebellum uh, and cre create cerebellar ataxia. So you have to look at some of these foods and food cross reactions with our nervous system or our brain, basically. Okay. So what are some of the symptoms of a cerebellum problem? Episodes of Disorientation or dizziness is a common complaint. Um, sometimes we'll have people come in and ex uh, complain of chronic back stiffness, right? They go, let's say, to the mall and just everything just tightens up. They're standing there. Um, the muscles of the spine uh, are controlled uh, to a certain extent by the cerebellum. So therefore, the muscles in the neck and lower back can become very uh, fatigued as well as very stiff. So stiffness and fatigue are the two signs of uh, cerebellar problems for some people. Even if they do, let's say, uh, adjunctive therapies like physical therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic, uh, stretching, uh, if the stiffness and the fatigue continue to come back despite all the modalities that you may be uh, performing, then you might have a cerebellar dysfunction which may be causing that, okay? Another one is being uh, easily motion uh, sick or car sick. So you're in a moving vehicle or a little bit of waviness of the ocean will create nausea uh, and, and uh, vomiting at, at points. But uh, dizziness is one of those things because that swaying or movement needs to go back into the cerebellum. If the cerebellum is not able to calibrate it correctly, you may experience some dizziness, nausea, etc. Uh, being in crowded places, sometimes the visual input of being in a crowded places will cause anxiety for some patients who have cerebellar problems. So being in a supermarket, being in an amusement park, not going on the rise, but just being in very crowded places uh, can create some issues for patients. Also difficulty walking. Um, you may sway to one side or another. So, so you'll have a patient who walk, but they always tend to kind of fall to one side. And that can be as a, uh, as a result of a weakness in the cerebellum or dysfunction in the cerebellum. Um, so uh, uh, unsteadiness, right? Uh, um, sometimes you will have patients who fall in the dark. So they get up in the middle of the night, they're walking, and they don't have that visual fixation or visual input and it's dark, so the cerebellum has to work extra hard to keep you uh, balanced and moving in the direction that you need to be, and they will fall in the dark. So people who tend to uh, fall or trip, uh, even in the daytime, they're walking and they, that's that, that person, they walk and they're always tripping on the carpet, 
Um, and those are the people who might have some cerebellar issues or cerebellar dysfunction. Um, also, clumsiness of the hands. So when you reach for things, you might knock over things. Um, uh, you might trip. So this clumsiness in the hands and feet can be a cerebellar issue. Okay? Another thing is you're going to notice that you, you might develop a small shake. A little shake in the hand as you reach for something. So if you're eating and you uh, take a spoon and you eat and you're coming to your mouth and you're coming and you start to shake, right? Or you reach out and try to grab a bottle of water and you go and your hands will shake. That could be a cerebellar tremor, right? Um, might not be disease, but dysfunction. Um, so you have to look at all these things. So in our office, what do we do to examine cerebellum? We look at different things. Um, there's different orthopedic tests and neurological examinations that can help us decipher what part of the cerebellum might be the issue. So we look at things like postural sway. So we have them uh, put your feet together, close your eyes. Is there a large sway one way or another, right? Or we might even do something more challenging and we do a tandem rhombus where you put one foot in front of the other and have the patient just stand there and then have them close their eyes and see how long it, it takes before they tip over. So those are some of the things that we look at. Also, with people with cerebellar problems, they have something called hypotonia. So lack of muscle tone. So when they walk, they kind of sway their arms, right? It's kind of like a loose, you know, noodle, basically very jelly-like. Um, and their feet will be broad-based, so it's a little bit of wide stance, gait, and they're just kind of like this. They have no muscle tone uh, for this, some of these species. Also, just like you have a tremor, as you might reach for something, um, based on the cerebellum, you may also have a tremor in the voice. So uh, we call it dysarthria, right? But dysphagia, sometimes difficulty swallowing uh, as a result of cerebellar problems. Cognition, right? Think, the ability to think and focus, uh, all related to the frontal lobe, but also for the cerebellum. And then eye movements. Eye movements gives us uh, uh, a good window into what the cerebellum might be doing. There are a lot of different names and uh, movement um, um, movements that we can do for the eye to help cerebellar activity. Um, basically, if you look at the eyes, it's kind of a window into how your brain is functioning. So eye movements are crucial in terms of determining it may be a cerebellar disorder, will it be a peripheral disorder, is it a BPPV. Um, eye movements help us a lot in terms of determining what might, like the cause might be. Okay? Um, sometimes patients will have head situations, so head movements. Right? If you look at um, some of the uh, head movements in some patients, um, if you look at Katherine Hepburn, if you look at her as she got older, she had this voice that vibrated, right? And then she had a head movement. That's where cerebellum uh, was degenerating at that time uh, for her. Uh, we also look at uh, what we call dysnetria. So like trying to go for something, you might miss your target. I'm reaching for something, but you kind of miss it and then we have to, we have to readjust. So we look at all these things when a patient comes in. Uh, we all have extensive questionnaires um, for each lobe of the brain as well as the cerebellum as the basal ganglia. All these things actually tie into the cerebellum. So it's, it's hard for us to say this exact portion of the cerebellum is causing all your problems. However, we can say this part of the cerebellum might be connecting this part of the brain and maybe if they're not talking to each other properly, then we can improve connection. With maybe just with balance exercises, maybe with some eye movements, maybe with just spinning gently to one side or another, or it might be a, uh, a maneuver like a, uh, an Epley's maneuver. So all these things can help uh, cerebellar disease. Uh, Epley's is more for the otoconia, so it's peripheral, but um, all these things can help uh, the cerebellum. So if you find that you have a lot of these symptoms that we just talked about, then you might be willing to come in for an examination to figure out where is it coming from? Is it left or right cerebellum? Is it midline? Is it intermediate? Is it lateral? Is it anterior lobe, posterior lobe, or flocular nodular lobe? It really depends, right? We have to look at a, a bunch of different factors to determine where your dizziness might be coming from. 
So it's very important to do a proper examination and proper questionnaire uh, or proper history to figure out what is going on with the patient. Uh, on this link, I'm going to put a little video of uh, a person who is an uh, eye movement of someone who might have a cerebellar problem. And what it is is you take healthy individuals and they have eye movements, right? And then you give them a drink and you check their eye movements again. And then you give them another drink and you have checked their eye movements. And the reason why, we, why they did that was to determine or to show you what alcohol can do to your cerebellum. Right? So your classic example of cerebellar problems or dysfunction is basically a drunk. They become, they slur their speech, they knock over things, they walk with their feet wide apart, right? Um, they are hypotonic, meaning they don't have muscle tone, and they sway to one side. So those are the patients that we look for in a very subtle way. So they might not be drunk in our office, but they have cerebellar dysfunction. So you could determine um, if a patient has a cerebellar, a cerebellar issue by doing a proper exam in history, okay? So I'm gonna put that video up so you can see so the eye movements change as a patient uh, or a person drinks alcohol because it starts to affect how uh, the calibration of eye movements will, uh, will occur, okay? So it's a fun video. Um, there's also a, a lot of different videos. If you look at cerebellar dysfunction and eye movements, you can Google it and put it in YouTube. You can find a lot of different videos uh, to look at eye movements for those types of things. But um, in our office, we obviously do an exam to figure that out. Um, so if, you're, um, if you or your friends are suffering from dizziness, um, please share this video. Uh, with them and like the page so we can continue to make good content uh, for you guys. Uh, my name is Dr. Jin Sung where clinical excellence meets excellent results and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Alright, bye.